Kaere Mai and welcome to the Maxim Institute podcast. My name is Jason and today I am joined on the podcast by Maxim researcher Ala Teo and Christians Against Poverty New Zealand social policy advisor Michael Ward as we discuss Maxim's latest issues paper, Beyond the Shadow of Debt, Shining a Light on High Cost Lending. Well, Ala and Michael, welcome along to the Maxim Institute podcast. It's great to have you guys here with us. Awesome to be here. Kia ora, Jason. Pleasure to be here. Well, Michael, why don't you introduce yourself to our listeners, some of whom may not be aware of who you are and what it is you do. Sure. Kia ora koutou. I'm Michael Ward, uh, Senior Policy Advisor at Christians Against Poverty, which is a debt counselling agency that provides free service for people who are struggling in debt. Um, so I live in the South Island in Motueka with my with my wife and five kids, and we hail from Auckland and made the trip down here last year. My full-time job is just helping government and people see the challenges for those who are struggling in poverty. Well, our, our podcast today is about Allah's paper, which came out just a couple of weeks ago, and it's to do with uh, the consumer credit lending, that kind of industry, and the triple CFA, which we'll get into later, all these different acronyms. I was wondering if you guys would give us a rundown of what the um, the industry and the landscape in New Zealand looks like. Sure. Michael? Go. <laughs> cool. cool. So um, consumer credit lending uh, in Aotearoa is essentially when a person borrows money to buy something for their personal use. Um, so that can be a loan to buy something really big, like a house, like a, like a mortgage is a type of consumer credit contract. Um, or they can be real small, like payday loans, if you need 200 bucks just to get through the week until your next um, benefit payment or your next pay cycle. Um, and there's all kinds of common products in the middle. So like all the products you get from the bank. So that could be a credit card um, or a loan from the bank or an overdraft. Credit cards can be from like... Um, stores like farmers, but then there's personal loans um, and vehicle finance loans. Um, so lending, consumer credit lending is all this type of borrowing from companies that are, are in the business of lending. So it doesn't cover like family loans or student loans. It's pretty broad. Yeah, I was going to say that that encompasses quite a lot of life in New Zealand in general. Are there different types of lending, different levels of lenders? You mentioned um store credit cards and vehicle finance how's it kind of broken down in the industry so they have um different tiers of lending they call it so the different levels which you think of tier one is quite quite safe lending maybe from from banks who are reputable who only lend to people who can afford it uh, then you've got uh, tier two lending which might be kind of personal finance companies that are prepared to lend a bit more and a bit more flexible with their terms and who they lend to and then you have tier three and then uh, really kind of fringe lenders like cowboy loan shark types who might uh, lend to people who are really struggling. And um, so it's kind of broken up into tiers. Yeah. So you've got some big players, which are like the banks, and you've got some medium sized players um, like credit unions and other medium sized finance companies. And then you've got what I call the naughty lenders, um, <laughs> our payday right. lenders. Um, which also includes um, actually pawnbrokers and like cash converters, those types of uh, stores are lenders, um, and mobile traders are the so the guys that you see in trucks going around to people's houses. So there have been a number of changes in the finance and lending industry and the legislation around that. I wonder if you guys could trace for us some of the factors that have influenced the changes, both historically and even more recently? Yeah, so there's been kind of consumer credit laws uh, around for a while now, for about 20 years. Um, some big changes came into effect in 2003. And the government of the time was really trying to introduce some laws that were all about preventing consumer harm. So that's about like people falling into debt and being unable to get out of them and just becoming slaves to this debt machine. Um, and the law was changed a lot in 2015 to introduce what they call responsible lending principles, which placed a much higher requirement on lenders to take care of their customers. Um, but despite those changes in 2015, 
um, there have continued to be like a couple of main factors that the recent changes have tried to address. One of those is this kind of predatory lending, and we've touched on those with the truck shops and these payday loans that were just taking advantage of people. But the other is around consumers who fall into debt spirals, and whether that's with a really high expensive loan or whether it's just with an ordinary loan, just a large number of them, but that's people getting into debt and being unable to escape from the ever kind of growing um, amount of interest and charges that they might pay, and they fall further into further into harm. How might something like that happen, Allah? Have you have you seen some of that in your work? Yeah, um, I guess in, I'm still quite new to the lending space, um, but what I've sort of seen, I mean, I grew up in South Auckland, um, and that is prime territory for predatory lenders, um, you know, the likes of Instant Finance and um, who are the other ones? Altair. I'm not sure yeah. if I should be saying their names. Oh, well. And um, cash, con- no, cash converters, they're in the hood. Yes, everywhere. Um, and even the mobile, like I, I just vividly remember seeing those red trucks, the mobile trader trucks on my street growing up and thought it was normal until like I moved away from home and would like ask friends, oh, did you ever have these trucks? <laughs> like come around, <laughs> not around to your house, but were they ever in your neighborhood? Only to sort of discover and further study and like some community work that actually <laughs> these guys aren't good guys. Like it seems convenient because they're bringing goods to your house, but um, like the, the fine print wasn't always um, favorable for the consumer. And in terms of fine print, I think some of the affordability assessment um, things issues have been prior to these recent changes. Those are always tro- like troublesome where. Um, people were clearly being given loans um, that they couldn't service or they couldn't repay because affordability assessments weren't conducted uh, with due diligence or care. And essentially, you could say some lenders were just looking for ways to lock people in to get their repayments. And so a lot of that comes down to what the Responsible Lending Code provides um, as guidelines for safe and ethical lending. Others saw as loopholes for harmful lending. Yeah, does that sound about right, Mike? Yeah, I I think Allah's really nailed it on the head. Um, One of the key issues that our work at Christians Against Poverty comes across all the time is people who have been given loans who genuinely can't afford them. And so they're stuck in this cycle of having to give too much of their weekly income to pay this loan. And then they don't have any savings left to be able to meet their current expenses. So they've got no other option but to go and get another loan. And this is happening all the time. Like, and Allah's perfectly right to say, growing up in South Auckland, see this. I grew up in Papakura and spent some time there and with my my family and to have people come and knock at your door or um, to come to sell you stuff that you don't need, but they won't sell you the goods for cash. They'll only sell it to you on finance arrangements. And that's, it's just, um, it, it was just, trapping people into a situation that they could not escape from. Mm. Yeah. Wow. So you've mentioned some of those past changes to the laws in 2003, 2015 to deal with some of this and to help prevent the harm to the to the consumers. What about now? So there's been recent changes that have come into effect. We've heard a lot about them from banks. Why are these changes such a big deal now? What is it about these ones that have that have caused this uproar in many ways? Well, I, I think that um, part of the issue is that um, the, the new laws that came into effect in 1 December in 2021 are now placing a much higher expectation on lenders to demonstrate how they conducted their affordability assessment. So each lender, when they give out a loan, has to make some inquiries to determine that a borrower was going to be able to afford it without falling into further hardship, into significant hardship. But the effort that was made prior to 1 December was really loose, shall we say. And that we had countless of examples at Christians Against Poverty of lenders who really were only just doing a tick box exercise and really not taking whether a family can afford to feed their kids and pay this loan seriously at all. One example that comes to mind is a lender who had given a beneficiary uh, who had three children in her sole care and she, one of the children had a really significant disability. This lady had nothing to her name in terms of financially. She had, she had less than zero dollars and yet this was her 23rd loan in a row from this finance company that 
all your listeners will have heard of before. And th with taxpayer support through her benefit, she had repaid them over $130,000 over a period of uh, about 20 years. And this is horrendous and it happens all the time. So I think one of the challenges with the, the current law that's caused such kind of a ripple effect through the lending industry is that it's now placing a much higher expectation on lenders to demonstrate that they've actually taken that care uh, appropriately. And they're now having to document whether the loan's affordable. And so some people, lenders who may have been getting away with it before and had quite loose systems now don't have the ability to do that. Directors uh, um, of the company and senior executives of lending companies are now personally responsible and liable for these mistakes. So I think this is another big issue for lenders as well, that it's not just a slap on the wrist. There are some really significant penalties that the law imposes for those who have broken up. And Ala, in um, the news recently, we've heard things about like Kmart shopping trips and Netflix subscriptions and things like that. Do these things actually factor in or are these part of like the headline grabbing that the banks or, or the finance industry is using to try and push back against this law? Mm, I think some of the sort of narrative around these recent changes have kind of, yeah, been swayed in a certain direction in terms around mortgages and um, yeah, mortgage brokers and banks, which is um, important, but that it has deterred um, attention and focus from the intention of these changes, which is to ensure that lenders, doesn't matter what tier you're in, that you're actually that they're actually doing their due diligence by all borrowers, in particular those vulnerable to financial hardship. And so some lenders had already been doing this before the changes, um, but there are still a few, and there might still be a few actually right now, um, that weren't complying with, with these. And so, yes, mortgages are important, but like the the clients at CAPSEs or even sort of Ngā Tangata or Good Shepherd, which are two microfinance organisations, mortgages aren't on the cards for them. And so they've, yeah, it's a different um, financial landscape for them. But often the stories that Michael's just shared, those haven't made the media, even though it's quite alarming and terrible that this happens in our 21st century. And so mortgages is only one part of the story. The harmful side of it is what hasn't been given like, you know, especially things like um, buy now, pay later, which is one of the issues that we had come across in our issues paper um, as, as basically impending, <laughs> not destruction, um, but sort of this impending harm that if we don't have legislative changes like the triple CFA that try put safeguards into our lending industry to make sure that all borrowers are protected. You know, free credit or interest-free credit is is going to be more detrimental for the borrower than it is for the lender. Hopefully that made sense. Well, you highlighted in the, the recent issues paper, we've we've done the, the buy now, pay later was one of the things. Another one was, um, uh, which is unregulated. That's right, mm, isn't it? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's lending, it's interest-free credit, um, and it is a type of lending. You're essentially using money that you don't have then and there to make a purchase, and you're spreading it out over a number of payments. That operates like a loan. It smells like a loan. It looks like a loan. I don't want to say it tastes like a loan, but you know, it's got the makeup of a loan, yet it doesn't have the same um, safety checks that you would get with a traditional loan, which is paperwork. Um, checking credit reports, all those things. This particular um, innovation, some call it, it is innovative, but um, innovation also requires safeguards too. And this this particular um, innovation doesn't have that and it's not regulated, but hopefully it will be regulated, eh, Michael? Yeah, I, I think Alice touched on a really important point around buy now, pay later products, which are really exploding into the shops everywhere. You go into any shopping mall, and we've seen examples of, you know, you can now spread payments for your medical treatment um, across across several weeks. And um, it sounds highly convenient and they market it as interest free, um, but it's but it's certainly not cost free. If you um, you you'll pay um, um, maybe an establishment fee, um, you'll certainly pay if you fall into a res where you don't make a payment on time. Each lender that gives out consumer credit contracts. Uh, is required under the responsible lending principles to really take care of their customer and to make sure that they can afford a loan. And this is a group of loans that falls outside of this 
legislation currently. Mm -hmm. So as Allah says, it is a loan. You are buying stuff today and paying for it with hopefully future money. And so it's really important that people are customers are taken care of and are, um, all the all lenders are subject to these same responsible lending principles. You, you work with um, Christians Against Poverty, Michael. So you would see some of the impacts of this kind of irresponsible lending. Could you share with us some of those, what, what you've seen when, when um, these lending companies are irresponsible and how that affects the, the clients that you see and their families? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's probably worth talking a little bit about what CAP does. Mm. Um, yeah. So we are a nationwide service that, that provides um, free debt counseling services to people who are struggling, uh, struggling in unmanageable debt. So what that means is that um, if you are struggling to repay your debt and it's feeling overwhelming, you can call us for free advice. Um, so we will sit with you and help you to build a budget to make sure that you have enough money set aside for your your needs of you and your Fano. But then we'll also help to advocate with your lenders to make sure that your repayments to them are affordable and suitable. And then if you're in debt to help you pay that off in a way that's manageable and sustainable for you. So one half of CAP service is really about working with people in their financial situation. But the other half of CAP's um, service is really about wrapping around our clients who are often feeling very overwhelmed by their situation to make sure they're loved and cared for through this really difficult time while they get back up on their feet. So what it looks like for people who come to Christians Against Poverty is sadly a very familiar tale time and time again. It's usually people who have who are now in debt because they have for a long period of time been trying to do the best they can to stay on top of their circumstances. But over a period of time, it slowly becomes, it's become worse and worse. The debt has grown. They are falling behind on their loan repayments. They are behind on their rent. They may be behind on their bills. Uh, they have no savings. Um, they're struggling to put food on the table because the amount of money that they're paying for, for their loans. And whenever some big crisis happens in their life, like their car's broken down, or they need to find, they need to come up with a bond because they need to move houses, it just looks impossible. And it's really overwhelming. Um, so that's the kind of financial situation. But what really hurts the most, I think, for families and for the people that CAP works with is just the anguish and uh, sense of drowning that being in debt is. So it, it feels like overwhelming and you feel like you're a bad parent and it's ruining your relationships and it's causing you to have sleepless nights. And it's, it's really crushing. So the work that CAP does is not only to help people with their finances, but also just to give them hope that things will be better. Absolutely. And some of the work that I got to participate in in my wonderful year with Michael and the team at CAP, I got to listen and interview some clients and just listen to their stories around uh, mainly, yeah, around their financial situations, but even things like dealing with debt collectors and vehicle financing and yeah, there's a lot of hardship that we don't often hear about in our sort of mainstream media or know about because it's not part of our world. Um, and so, yeah, just to echo what Michael said, there's a lot of um, one. I think one line that stayed with me is like the shadow of debt that clients can feel like it sort of just follows them. And it's sort of this hovering presence that can be debilitating or it feels, yeah, make them feel like they can't participate in society um, or be able to strive towards having a, a, towards a flourishing life because they've got this thing just looming over them. But organizations like CAT, their point of difference is the support, the wraparound support. I think it's important to highlight that is the wraparound support that they have along with their debt counseling services. And a lot of that is done through a local setting, through a local church, um, through a person in that client's neighborhood or um, that live in the area. So it, it ties in the element of grassroots, which we love to see and don't often hear about in terms of this type of mahi being done is that it's actually majority of the time volunteers. Is that right, Michael, in terms of debt coaches? Yeah, for sure, Alan. So, so many of the debt coach network across the country who are stepping foot into people's homes uh, to meet them where they're at they're, are volunteers in their local community because they love their community they love god they believe that they've 
can make a difference where they are into the people's lives around them. So it's really good to be able to go and meet people where they're at and, and to help connect people to other services that they might need. Because debt is like a bit of a spider's web it, and or tentacles that kind of reaches and not only to ruin your finances, but um, maybe you need access to mental health services to go and see your GP. Uh, maybe you need help with childcare. And so the opportunity to have wraparound support, as Ala mentioned, to help lift off some of this dark shadow that people follow, um, that follows people around and give people the opportunity to actually have some hope for the future that things can actually look better. I remember speaking to um, one client who she had been in debt all her life since she had turned 20, which was what it was, what it used to be before you could go and get a loan. And she was 53 when Cap mm -hmm. helped her to become debt free. And she said, I've never been out of debt. I've always been in debt. And that's really common to come across this sentiment from our clients that this is something they're going to be stuck with for their entire life. Yeah, absolutely. And it can be generational too. Mm -hmm. um, I think we often don't hear about that when it, when it around issues like social issues like poverty. Like one client I just spoke to was a 22-year-old who said that she had seen cycles of poverty and debt in her family and she wanted to be the circuit breaker and her her journey with CAP was her stepping towards being a circuit breaker, not just for her family, but even for her own little family. Um, she had a daughter. And so hearing stories like that where CAP provides as a place of hope and that allows people to see that they can live without debt and work towards being debt free. That was pretty, yeah, that was that was quite a moment actually, now that I now that I've reflected on that particular conversation when she was like, yeah, this has given me hope for my daughter, which we don't often hear. And I wish people would hear more of those stories and sort of see this other side of, of this whole lending picture is that it isn't just profit. It isn't just big banks. These are people, their lives and livelihoods that are also at play and that need to be considered with equal standing too, not just because the big guys have all the money, but rather actually our families and communities that may not always feel like they have a voice, people like CAP, organizations like CAP, people like Michael, give them a voice. So Yeah, that's awesome. I think that highlighting what people don't see. I mean, we think about people in debt and we kind of just think about the numbers. Oh, you know, they're, they're earning less than they're spending or something like that. But we don't imagine, I, and I'm not even sure why, but we don't imagine the story behind that and the emotional toll that that takes and the relational toll. So I think that's, that's so important for us to highlight. There's a we've talked about a couple of uh, areas in the lending landscape that are unregulated. Uh, we talked about uh, buy now, pay later, which is new and kind of hasn't. I don't think a lot of people have realised that it's actually a loan, and so they're kind of like, yeah, this is this is great, this is innovative. I can get what I want now, and I can I can pay it off, and and that's cool. The other one is, is debt collection that's actually not regulated at all. What, what are some of the changes that you guys would like to see in these areas moving forward? Allah's report has done um, a great job of kind of picking apart some of the issues that we see with, um, with debt collection. So I'll give you my thoughts, but I'm sure she'll round it out really nicely. Yeah, it's, when we look overseas to jurisdictions like Australia or in, in the US or over in the UK, there's some significant um, guidelines and regulatory frameworks around what debt collection actually looks like and how it should be operated and, and how it can be done respons responsibly. And here in New Zealand, it's a really untouched subject. And debt collectors, we hear time and time again stories from our clients of people just being harassed mm -hmm. and bullied and extorted for money that they can't possibly pay. And it just puts such a burden of stress and anxiety on people. And it's not a fair and, a, and responsible way to give people the opportunity to repay their debts. Many people want to repay their debts. They want to do the right thing. They just can't right now, or they need some advocacy and some help to be able to do so. So we've got people who have got debt collectors showing up at their workplace um, or calling their boss and telling them they're in debt or putting stuff on Facebook uh, about them or harassing them by getting a robot to call them 20, 30 times a day, all times of night. It just wears people down. And that's the way that, that currently operates. Debt collection in New Zealand currently operates by being the squeakiest wheel. And, and by, by harassing people to give you the most money. 
And so it's really impossible for people to juggle that. And so we'd love to see some guidelines and framework here in New Zealand that mimics what we see overseas in terms of protection for people who just need advocacy and support to be able to pay their debts responsibly. Mm, Absolutely. I mean, I think the work, majority of the work's been done if we look at the UK and Australia and the guidelines they have around their debt collection practices and industries. I mean, our economies are similar in some ways. And so it makes sense like I want to say common sense but common sense isn't so common today so I want to say that it is glaringly obvious that we could employ these guidelines um, that we've seen work overseas and that they've been implemented for a lot longer and so we can take um, lessons from them yet um, we, we seem to yeah I think it's one of those overlooked areas that people sort of if you, it's sort of you turn a blind eye um, and pretend that it doesn't exist but actually if you sort of dig a bit deeper which I did with this issues paper there's some pretty horrendous practices that go on that you know would be classed as coercion or harassment you know if you put it in other contexts um, it's quite alarming, yet when you put it in the context of debt collection, it seems to be accepted, which just blows my mind that those things like constantly calling someone or even falsifying documents to a borrower, pretending to be a, a court document, requiring them to make payments, that's clear fraudulent, and you get done for fraud you know, in, in a legal context. So why should it be acceptable and only get a slap in the hand in, in, the, in the context of debt collection? And, and it does because it's not regulated or there aren't clear guidelines. Um, I think this is an opportunity for the government, doesn't matter who's in house, to be able to put down or bed down some safety measures and safeguards for all borrowers. I think we always, there's a sort of narrative that it's just for vulnerable borrowers, but actually each one of us are a loan away or a bad financial decision away from being in a, in a vulnerable position ourselves. So I think when that often the framing is tends to sort of marginalize a group of people, but actually we're all, we're all at risk of being in a vulnerable situation and at risk of being having a debt collector turn up at our doorstep I remember one client interview with the report that I helped um, with CAP that Michael also contributed to on debt collection she (laughs) recalls um, that she had someone turn up at her house dressed like in a vest and an earpiece with a walkie looking like a police officer and just like this really loud, not quite authoritative knock, which alarmed her but she said that she was able to just put her foot down and say I can't pay this debt now. I've called the creditor and tried to make repayments. But she was saying if she, um, that wasn't her first dealing with a debt collector, but she was saying it isn't common. Like if, if she wasn't aware of what to do, she would sign whatever paperwork was handed to them. And usually the repayment plans that they make you sign then and there are even put you in a worse off position. And so but these practices go on because they're not regulated or there aren't clear guidelines. And um, even though it's 2020, two and the call for regulation has been on the cards for a long time from what I've seen in some of the like submissions and community advocacy that's going on and so yeah really really hoping that some of this work and even this podcast contributes towards conversations between the industry and advocates to arrive at a common language around what is ethical and safe and acceptable debt collection behavior so these changes to the to the triple CFA that have come into effect in December last year, uh, there's been some changes, some some good changes, some areas that need to be uh, addressed a bit more. We've talked a bit about those. It's going to be a little bit difficult to measure the impact of them this close to the the legislation coming into effect, I imagine. But are there any ways that you've seen maybe that it has impacted? And where are some more gaps? We've talked about buy now, pay later. We've talked about the the debt collection area. Are there other gaps that maybe need to be filled as well? I I think one thing is to have the regulation, but to touch on the issue around like, will will we see this, the effects of this come into effect? Um, Will we see the the impact of this coming into effect soon? I think the issue is, is really around enforcement. It's one thing to have the rules and to have them written down on a bit of paper, but whether they are, followed up on taken seriously whether there's been changes in the behavior of lenders I think is what's going to take some time to bid in but I'm really hopeful that um, particularly around the affordability assessment stuff uh, with the changes to director and managing executive responsibilities 
that we'll see some changes to the way that loans are assessed quite quickly. So there's been conversations in the media about, you know, the number of vehicle loans dropping uh, since the regulations came into effect. I'd say well, fantastic because so many of them were just ripping off and taking advantage of people that it's, it's good if, though, if that harm is no longer taking place. Or you, would, you would expect a drop to take place if these, if these rules are, are working as the way they're supposed to. So yeah, that, that's something I'd love to see come in through and that says clients present to them present to cap with debt that they're appearing less and less frequently with these with these troublesome loans Mm, absolutely and I think also probably just to double down on Michael's point around enforcement um, I know that that was one thing I hadn't really talked about but in what I've seen the rules are pretty prescript I mean they're well laid out um, and they're pretty clear on what um, got what is ethical and safe um, and responsible lending behavior a lot of the trouble is the enforcement and so it'd be great to see more work um, around you know the regulatory bodies at play like the commerce commission or even the the dispute resolution schemes and um, like betting down what their role is and even the courts and, and clarifying um, what that enforcement looks like because um, what's the point of having rules and then not necessarily having um <laughs> other things in place to reinforce them you know sort of like you would have a rugby match and just have the rules and no ref but everyone just decides what the rules are for themselves it's a little bit like that when you've got some pretty awesome rules but no enforcement um, to back those rules up or help put them into place I think another one is is um, that I will I think not remain in gaps in the legislative part but also just in the lending spaces better alternatives for credit or safer alternatives. Um, I know I mentioned in the issues paper, we talked about microfinance and um, there needs to be, we know that lending and borrowing is heavily a part of our society. It's heavily ingrained in our economies. So, and ideally we'd want really bad lending products off the market, but the reality is they exist. And so um, as much as I know for myself, we want to remove lending, we need to also think about what are the alternatives that people have? What can they turn to instead of turning to bad options like payday loans or really quick loans of minimal paperwork, buy now, pay later? What are some other safer, more responsible and ethical products we can have on the market um, in order to not match, that's for use of a better word, but to give people options um, instead of running only to options that land them in problem debt or unmanageable debt. As we come to, to finish this podcast, let's, let's finish with some hopeful vision. How would you guys, uh, both of you, what, what would you hope to see in the lending space here in New Zealand uh, in the future? Uh, I don't know, maybe five, 10 years down the track, maybe not even that long, maybe in the near future, what would you hope our, our lending landscape would look like? Let's finish with something positive. Um, I know from my end, being sort of new to this space, but having sort of seen the impact of it growing up, I yeah would like to see less naughty lenders or less harmful lending, more safe and ethical lending products that provide financial inclusion for all people. Um, we know that there are like a, a group of people in New Zealand that don't have things like a bank account or they've got bad credit, those things shouldn't exclude people from participating, you know, and or the ability or shouldn't impair, impair, severely impair their ability to be able to access a loan for things like, you know, like an appliance that they need at home, like whiteware, or be able to participate in having a flourishing life. But and also regulation of debt collection. I think it's my like <laughs> My, my like one thing that I want to get out of this of participating and being able to contribute to the mahi in, in the lending space is regulation or guidelines for debt collection in particular. Yeah, awesome. I would I, I would um, total call what Allah has just said. That's that's really important. We in in New Zealand Aotearoa we 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 are not particularly good at saving. We're we're pretty bad at it on the whole. And we don't have really great financial capability skills, but there's some good work being done to try and lift people's financial capability, to lift their understanding of how money works and how they should be saving for the future. I would like to think that over five to 10 years that New Zealanders could place a much greater emphasis on being able to pay for things with cash or rather than being able to 
only pay for things using their future earnings. That like, a growth in safe or ten, uh, alternative lending options would would be great. And we've one thing that we we see overseas that I would like to see replicated here in New Zealand is greater level of access to uh, free consumer advocacy services for people who for people who are stuck with their loan or who have received a letter that they just don't know what to do about from a debt collector, and they can actually call someone for free advice around what to do with that. There's Citizens Advice Bureau here in New Zealand, which does a great job, but there's real, if we look overseas to Australia, there's the uh, Consumer Action Law Centre that provides specific information relating to consumer credit. In the work that Christians Against Poverty does, we, we see hundreds and thousands of dollars being written off unfair loans if people have access to advocacy. Um, so I'd love to see that more, more frequently here in New Zealand. Allah and Michael, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Kia ora, Jason. Thanks for having us. Thanks for joining us on this edition of the Maxim Institute podcast. Make sure that you subscribe to our podcast on whatever platform you listen on so that you don't miss a single episode. If you'd like to hear more from us and keep up with the rest of our research, analysis and policy in New Zealand, you can sign up on the homepage of our website to get our monthly forum email and invitations to future Maxim Institute events. From the team at Maxim, goodbye for now.